high school sports, we've got it covered. Overtime, sponsored by Wendy's. They got you for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and everything in between. Hello everyone, welcome to Overtime and welcome to football season, football in March. Yeah, I'm Scott Lubber. And I'm David Greenberg. We said goodbye to basketball season last week and we say hello to football this week. We'll try our best not to refer to touchdowns as slam dunks, but we do have some touchdowns to bring you on this opening night. Lots of highlights, including a battle of state-ranked teams, Lena Winslow and Princeton. We'll also spotlight a Winnebago football player who just won't give up no matter how many times he gets knocked down. We'll also look ahead to some of tomorrow's action. And we'll be joined live here in studio by our new analyst, Tim Bailey, to break down one of tonight's key Nick 10 games. Let's get to it. And we will begin in the Nick 10. A lot of teams are playing at alternate stadiums this season so they can preserve their grass surfaces by playing on turf. So tonight, the defending Nick 10 champion, Boylan Titans, played a home game on the turf at Harlem against East. Did you follow all that? Now the stands were filled to 20% capacity there. The Boylan student section, these guys are ready for football season. Hey, Tristan Guile here is back at running back for the Titans. He scores on a six yard run in the first quarter. Now look at the Titans defense. Matthew Logan just slings down Shamar Lewis. Then back on offense, Guile will take a dump pass. Watch the stiff arm here. And then he is going to come right into your living room. Look out, hello. Benito Jass is the Titans quarterback this year. Let's watch Jass go to work here. He's going to roll out with a run pass option. He chooses to run, and a great run it is as he spins and bites into the end zone, lunging, and the Titans went up 14 to nothing. Still in the second quarter, Jass wants to pass. And look at this, he has a wide open Joey Apino. That's a 37-yard touchdown. Coach Catch, I think he's going to take that play every day of the week. Now things got hairy here in the third quarter after a late hit. The two teams come together, a little shoving. Fortunately, no punches thrown. The East coaches did a good job getting this under control. No ejections, just some offsetting penalties. Boylan opens with a 41 to nothing shutout of the ERABs. Well, we are joined now by our analyst this season, Tim Bailey. Many of you you know Tim, he's a former Boylan football standout and the top trainer at Mercy Health Top Performers. He's worked with all the big names, Fred Van Bleet, James Robinson, Dean Lowry, helping to mold them into better athletes. Tim knows his uh, stuff, so Tim, we are so glad that you were here and part of the me. team this year. Tonight we had you at that East Boylan game from start to finish. Uh, let's start with the ERABs. They want to run the football under Coach Griffin. That's, that's what Coach Griffin does. Didn't quite work out for him tonight. Yeah, that's their bread and butter. Um, you, know, you know, I spoke with Coach uh, Griff before the game, and he said 99.9% .9 of the time throughout the game, they're just going to run the ball. And, and that's, that's, that's East High School's forte. They like to run the ball. Their offense is predicated on the run. You know, when you're playing East High School, you know you have to be prepared for the run. But... Um, you know, going forward, you know, after this week, I like to see East mix it up a little bit. I like to see East maybe try to throw the ball, um, you know, a couple, a couple times a game just to get some momentum, just to try to create a better offense. You know, you and, I, you and I were talking earlier at the game how East likes to start their tailback way back deep in the offensive backfield. Are you, what do you think of that? Henry? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's something that I don't like. Um, you know, I think the tailback should be within at least five or six yards of scrimmage. Um, you know, this, this tailback is getting a, a head start. He's at 12 yards back in the backfield, and he's having to be able to actually pick up some steam to be able to get the handoff. And you saw tonight things were kind of sloppy, you know, with the pitches and the handoffs and things like that, and the timing really wasn't there. And, and personally, I think that's all due to the, the running back being lined up so deep. Going to Boylan just for a quick second here, what did you think of – New quarterback Benito Jazz coming in in uh, in his first season. I like Jazz. Um, you know he gets the job done. Um, you know you know Coach Catch obviously he trusts him. Um, and tonight he showed great poise. You know back there, um, you know controlling the offense. Um, a great runner. Um, you know he's not going to be the type of quarterback that's going to you know you know wow you with 200 300 yards a game. But you know he's going to he's going to fight. He's going to command his troops, um, and he's going to do what he can to get that W up on the board. Yeah, they had a big win tonight. Last year they were nine and zero. Can they continue that same type of success this season? You think? Well, you know, you know, I, I, I think they can. I think um, you know, Boylan's always going to be one of those top teams in in, in the um, in the conference. And you know, as long as guys stay healthy, 
Um, it's a short season, so, you know, I mean, you saw a lot of injuries um, happen tonight with a few guys from East, I think a couple guys from Boylan. So, but if they can stay healthy, um, yes, I do think the Titans and some other top-tier teams can actually have a shot at this uh, in the next six weeks. Tim, East last year played C.J. Berry, an explosive athletic player as their quarterback. They've moved him now to more of a running back. Uh, but we did see him late in the game tonight go back to quarterback a little bit. I just, I just wonder if maybe as the season progresses, maybe do you think we might see C.J. Berry back at quarterback for East? Or how, what's the best way to use that I, young I, man? I think the best way to use Berry is, is, is you know, you want the, that type of kid, you want the ball in his hands at all times. And I think the adjustment that Coach Griff made was, was, was an A-grade adjustment, um, you know, bringing him in at quarterback and allowing him to get the, get the ball in his hand a little bit more, as I alluded to earlier. You know, with him lining up in the backfield so deep at 12 yards, it was hard for him to be able to get any type of really good downhill run, any, any good downhill momentum built up because of, you know, the defense of Boylan. If you know Boylan's defense, I mean, they, they got some big boys up front. Um, and those boys were in the backfield within a split second. So I think part of the adjustment was also due to, um, you know, being able to get the ball into Barry's hands immediately without any type of um, hiccups along the way. Obviously, it was not East tonight. Tonight, the scoreboard speaks for itself. What do you think that they can take as a positive moving forward for uh, for the rest of the season? I think East can learn from this. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure, like all high schools do, they'll go back, um, either watch film on Sunday or Monday, um, and make those adjustments. You know, if if I'm a high school athlete today, you know, these kids have to pay attention in the film room because you want to correct those mistakes. You don't want to go out week in and week out mm -hmm. making the same mistakes that you made in week one and week two and week three, and you're still making those same mistakes in week four and week five. So, um, you know, I think ease can take a lot away from this. Um, you, know, you know, don't turn the ball over. Um, you know, know your assignments. Um, you know, work on your timing and things of that nature. So um, I, I don't think this is, this is the end of the road for East over the next six weeks. I think they're going to make some, they're going to make some minor adjustments, and I think they're going to be okay. Tim, thanks for the input, and... Join us again next week, all right? Absolutely. You're going to be back here, right? Thank you. Yes, all I right. Will. Thanks, Tim. That's Tim Bailey, folks. We've got more Nick 10 action straight ahead. We'll get our first look at James Cooper and the Harlem Huskies. Could they get out of the gate fast tonight at Auburn? You're watching Overtime. James Cooper II hasn't been around forever in the Nick 10. It just seems that way to the coaches around the conference. Cooper's in his fourth season as Harlem's starting quarterback. He holds almost every passing record in Harlem's record book and some conference records as well. This season he could pass Jace Bankard and become the conference's all-time leading in passing yards.
tonight. Cooper and the Huskies open up at Auburn. First quarter, Auburn ball. Jaquan Brady takes the snap. William Key gets stuffed by Adrian Palos and Jack Huffman. Harlem has the ball in the red zone. James Cooper takes the snap and scores on the QB sneak. That gives Harlem the 6-0 lead. Second quarter now, Harlem ball. Cooper takes the snap, rolls right, launches, and finds his receiver, Dominic McCarron, for the touchdown. This time, Harlem would make good on their two-point attempt. Next possession for the Huskies. Cooper hands off to Palos, who carries the defender in for the end, into the end zone. Ensuing possession for Harlem after the Auburn turnover. Cooper takes the snap, rolls, looks, and fires, and it's Daisy on Jordan for the score. Harlem went for two, and again, couldn't convert, but they win big, 36-12. to Cooper's not rusty. At Swanson Stadium, Guilford hosted Belvedere, and hey, Jim Morrow made his debut as the head coach of the Bucks, his alma mater. Morrow was the head coach at Harlem for 15 seasons. Guilford's ball, Antique Muhammad is going nowhere. Joe Alvarez sees to that with a tackle for loss. Justin Dennis on the QB keeper for the Bucks. How about this slick run? He's still going. And still going. He finally brought down inside the 35. Dennis again. On the keeper again. <laughs> Another good run. Kind of like the way he moves. He's, he's deceptively shifty and quick. He's finally shoved out of bounds at the six yard line. Jonathan Urbieta then standing up is into the end zone. Bucks led 7 6. Before halftime now. It's Alvarez on the keeper again. The sophomore plows in from a yard out. That made a 14 to 6 bucks. But Guilford rallied, forced overtime, and pulled this one out 20 to 14. Let's go to the Pretzel Bowl. Freeport hosted Jefferson. Second half. Jamari Adams takes the handoff, runs right, and he'll sneak his way into the end zone. 28 to 8. Pretzels lead. Tough sledding for the Jayhawks in the second half. But here's Nick James completing. The pass to Garrett. Garrett splits the defenders for the first down. Presses ball now. Xavion Segner. He'll go deep. Got a man. It's Kyrie Shirley. And Shirley hauls it in for the big gain. And look at this. He's pumped up. I would be too. Same possession. Segner with a quick pass to Corian Yule for the easy six. On the ensuing kickoff. Watch carefully as Demario Fleming returns it. Runs right, then Freeport's Teron Jackson just strips it, and Jackson runs all the way back for a touchdown. The Pretzel shut out the Jayhawks in the second half. Freeport wins this one 42 to 8. Two Nick 10 teams will kick off their seasons tomorrow afternoon. Hananiga will host Belvedere North at Harlem. Again, Hananiga pre preferring to play on the turf rather than its own field. Yeah, this could be the best Nick 10 matchup of the weekend. These two teams tied for second place in the conference last season. Now, Belvedere North graduated a huge senior class, but the Blue Thunder feel like they're still going to be very strong. I mean, last year, a great defense carried them to a 7-3 and record. One of those seven wins came against Hananiga. The Blue Thunder expect to be strong on the defensive side of the bowl again. I think our defense is going to be good again. I mean, Coach Beck always puts together a good game plan for our defense, and I think our offense will be able to hold its own ground. So, I you know, we got the better of them last year, uh, but, you know, up until that point, we hadn't beaten them for, I think, six years. Uh, so, you know, we know we're going to have to play our best game, you know, to have a chance to be successful. And I think we're all stoked. I mean, we've been waiting over a year for this. I'm pumped. I can't wait. The Hananiga Indians are also pumped. They return some key seniors, and they have a very talented junior class led by quarterback Isaac Wisenand. The Indians haven't forgotten about that loss to Belvedere North last season. You know, as a coaching staff, I think we've hyped it up a little bit. We said, hey, remember last season? Remember how that felt? Um, remember just uh, one or two plays can make a difference in the game. It's definitely a little chip on your shoulder when you know you lost to them last year, and uh, this year you just got to go out and compete. It's going to be a dogfight, and um, if we don't come prepared, then we're the same results going to happen last year, but I really think that we are prepared. I am looking forward to that game. And David, you made a little road trip tonight down to Princeton. I did, just a little one. There was a great matchup down there between two state-ranked teams. Lena Winslow took on the Princeton Tigers. We got the highlights and reactions from Lena Winslow's coach next.
Well, the last time the Lena Winslow Panthers took the field, they were winning another state championship. This year, there won't be playoff games or a state championship to shoot for. But some people were calling the Panthers opening game tonight in Princeton a state championship game of sorts. The Panthers are ranked number one in the state again in Class 1A. Princeton is ranked second in the state in the larger Class 3A. So, let's go to Princeton for this tantalizing matchup between the Panthers and the Tigers. Princeton got the ball to start the game. Quarterback Tyler Gibson going left. Tackle comes and he loses the ball. It's picked up by the Panthers. Ethan Fye and taken all the way back to the house for six. But Princeton was able to respond with NIU commit. Rondé whirls, lowering his shoulder and punching it in. Check out this next play here from Lena Winslow. Handoff goes to Mari Roby around the right side. Breaks a tackle, then cuts back into the open field, and nobody is catching the speedy junior. Lena Winslow back on top, 14-7. to This is a back-and-forth effort with two great teams. Tigers in the red zone now. Handoff to Worrells again, trying to get to the pylon, and he gets there for his second score of the game. This may have been the dagger here for Princeton. Gibson. Takes a snap, looks left, fires, and drops it right into the breadbasket of a wide open Bennett Searins with nothing but green grass in front of him. This one featured two great teams, but Lee Wynn falls to Princeton 35 to 14. All right, we've got one other NUIC game to talk to you, uh, to tell you about tonight. It was Orangeville 18, East Dubuque 14. All right, let's check out some eight man football now. South Beloit playing at Polo. Polo was rocking early on. Parker Wilbur off the handoff and all. Boy, he could go all the way, but not quite. Not so close. I hate it when that happens. Down at the two, but they turn the ball over on downs. Not fret those, the solos turn it over after the high snap, and the mark was back in business. And they would punch it in this time. Parker Wilbur getting the touchdown that he just missed earlier. Later on the first, Polo with it again. Tyler Meridian going to keep it. Pitches now to Wolber, and he's off to the races again. He'll get his second TD. It was 12 to nothing, Marcos. They need 11 guys on defense to stop him, not eight. South Beloit would not go away quietly, though. Here's the 6'4 tight end, Miles Beckham, going up and grabbing it with one hand. Oh, my. And you want to know how good a trick play works out? It fakes everybody out, including our cameras. That's Fernando Balderas taking it. In for the Sobos. Polo wins this one big, though, 52 to 26. Coming up next, we have the story of a local football player who refuses to give up. He is Winnebago senior Micah Gearhart with a message that we all can learn from.
All high school football players are eager to get back on the field and play again after the long COVID layoff. For one local football player, though, the pandemic has only been one hurdle that's been standing between him and the playing field. This is the type of play Micah Gearhart can make for Winnebago, darting into the backfield from his linebacker spot, bringing down an opposing ball carrier, or at running back, galloping through a defense to the end zone for a touchdown. Unfortunately, Winnebago fans haven't seen as much of that as they'd like to because Gearhart has been riddled with injuries since his freshman year. That year, he had a partially torn quad. His sophomore year, after week three, he needed surgery for a torn ACL, torn MCL, and torn meniscus. His junior year, he missed the last five weeks of the season after suffering a concussion. Later his junior year, during track season, he suffered another torn meniscus. And just a couple months ago, he fractured a wrist while lifting weights. Um, the hardest one was probably the ACL, just because it was such a long recovery. Was there ever a time after one of those injuries where you thought, uh, man, I might not be able to play football ever again? After the ACL one, it was, it was questionable. I know a lot of people had you know, been there with me, and they asked me, you know, are you going to play, play again? Gearhart's parents, Mike and Megan, were at the games when the injuries happened. Mike helps with stats. Megan's a physical therapist at her day job, but during football games, she's Winnebago's team photographer. The concussion was probably the hardest one, actually, for me to deal with. I'm comfortable with orthopedics, being with what I work in, so I kind of knew what to expect. Gerhard has spent so much time in rehab, he probably knows more about it than half the therapists in Rockford do. After each injury, he buckled down and went to work doing whatever he needed to do to repair his body. Did you ever consider, you know, just throwing in the towel and, and not trying to come back from all these? No, I, I just see an injury as an obstacle that you overcome, and once you overcome the obstacle, there'd be something waiting for you. What did you learn about Micah through all this? <laughs> He's a tough kid. <laughs> He's very tough, yeah. At first you don't think he can come through, you know, he'll have another problem and stuff. You just keep going and going and going. And now all of a sudden, yeah, he gets hit with another another dilemma. So it's one step forward and two steps back. And um, yeah, thankfully he's got the initiative and you know and the drive to keep going. Gearhart is healthy now and ready to roll into his senior season. He's a big piece to the puzzle for Winnebago's football team and he's an inspiration to his teammates and coaches. Yeah, I think it's that, just that competitive drive that he has, you know, to compete, and uh, I, I love that in him. He's kind of that emotional leader, too. The other kids feed off him, um, his intensity, his physicality. And what have all these trials taught Gearhart? I'd say a life lesson, just kind of enjoy it when you have it. Don't take it for granted. Gearhart has dealt with a lot for somebody so young. Now, we all get knocked down in life in various ways. Well, Mike is a good example of how we all just have to keep getting ourselves back up. No doubt. I think we'll all be rooting for Micah this season. Winnebago's first game will be next Saturday in Mendota against Stillman Valley. Well, let's take one final time out and check out another overtime flashback. It was October 2nd, 2015, another night when the great James Robinson dazzled at running back for the Lutheran Crusaders. The Mendota Trojans were his unfortunate victims. On his first carry of the night, Robinson broke loose for a 60-yard touchdown. That was the first of six times he would find the end zone rushing the football. Four of those touchdown runs covered more than 50 yards. Robinson wound up with 298 yards and only 10 carries. And for good measure, he added a 47-yard touchdown reception. Lutheran beat Mendota 54-7.
We wrap up this show with our play of the night. Back to the Boylan East game. Boylan quarterback Benito Jax. He'll throw. And Joey Apinos all by himself downfield. That was too easy, but still worth celebrating if you were wearing green. A 37-yard touchdown and our play of the night. Well, tomorrow there is more football to be played. Aquin against Dupac at Auburn's Wyatt Stadium. Galena against EPC on the turf at Freeport. Morris plays at Rochelle. Caneland at Sycamore. And Matea Valley will play at DeKalb. Be sure to join us each Friday night at this time for overtime. We also rebroadcast the show Sunday mornings at 9 on Fox 39. And remember, for highlights and scores anytime, go to our website, mystateline.com. That does it for this episode. Have a great weekend, everybody. Overtime, sponsored by Wendy's. They got you for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and everything in between.